This episode of Tales from the Arcanist is brought to you by you. To support us, receive exclusive content, and more, go to patreon.com slash thearcanist. That's patreon.com slash thearcanist. Thank you. Welcome back to Tales from the Arcanist. This week, we've been bitten by a distinct persuasion, and we try to find our way to the truth. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Tick Bit by Matt Goldberg The ticks dropped down from the trees thick as sleet. I'd been out hunting with my brother Paul when it happened. They fell in great heaps, burrowing into us, tangling themselves up in our hair, our clothes. We had to shake them from our boots. Out they spilled, endless grains of living sand scouring our toes for blood. We found them days later under our armpits, the backs of our knees, the crannies of our earlobes and then the telltale bullseye would emerge, hot and red. I'd gotten tick bites before, but never like this. I was a feast for an entire generation. I'm never going back there, Paul said, as he rubbed ointment on his welts. Never, I agreed. With tweezers, I pulled hard at the alien under my skin. Wanna go hunt? Paul asked about a week later. I didn't, not just because of the ticks. The thought of venison repulsed me. Nah, I said. Hmm, Paul said. Me neither. I think we might be sick with something. He wasn't wrong. Just the sight of a hamburger made me gag. At dinner that night, Mom forced me to eat a bite of the pot roast she'd made. It landed me in the hospital. I broke out in hives so bad I scratched the skin off my arms. After that, it was no more meat for me and Paul. Dad was horrified. Ain't right, my boy's turning down pork chops, he said. Ain't natural. We claimed it wasn't us. It was the ticks. Blaming it on the ticks, in a way, was like saying it wasn't our faults. We didn't choose to stop eating pork. Something else was at work. That initial patch of tick trees became a forest. Every time we went out for a walk, they'd rain down. Paul and I began wearing ponchos. Soon enough, ticks became the talk of the county. Everyone started getting bites. And just like us... Everyone started getting sick of meat. Didn't matter the kind. Cow, pig, sheep, chicken, duck. Even fish, for God's sake. Meat spoiled in the supermarket. It was the same with other animal products. Cheese made me woozy. I shivered at the mere mention of eggs. Prior to the tick bites, we were strictly a meat and potatoes household. Mom still made potatoes every night. Roasted, boiled, mashed, seasoned in all sorts of ways but she was at a loss for a main course. One night, upon seeing a steaming pile of potatoes, Paul took a stand. I just can't put another spud in my mouth, he said. You'll eat what's on the table, Mom said. Her eyes were red and puffy. This is an abomination, Dad said with a moan. He'd gone to the hospital at least five times trying to stomach Mom's meatloaf. His face was now pockmarked with hive scars. Meanwhile, I'd begun expanding my palate. After dinner, I tucked into my stash of dried mangoes, cashews, and kale chips. I kept it all hidden under my bed. I offered some kale chips to Paul. They're actually pretty good, I said. I'd rather eat dirt, Paul said. He spent the rest of the evening pouting in our room, pausing occasionally to sniff from a bag of beef jerky. He cried softly as the bag crinkled. We heard on the news that ticks were falling from trees everywhere, nationwide. Thousands of people were getting bit every day. It came for the countryside first, but the wind eventually spread the ticks to the cities. Little pockets of treeless city, almost always the poorest neighborhoods, became a refuge for meat eaters. Animals meant for slaughter were left to rot in their pens. Farmers didn't bother feeding them. There was no return on investment. The federal government established an emergency food education program and... Eventually, Mom learned to cook vegan. I no longer had to hide my new affinity for vegetables. Do you think it's a good thing? 
I asked Paul one night, while lying on our bunk beds, him on top, me on the bottom, as always. Like, the ticks were heaven-sent or something? I don't know, Paul said from above. Maybe God hates us. Or it's just tough love, I said. Can't know God's ways, Paul said. It wasn't until the last city was overrun by ticks that they stopped coming down from the trees. They just up and vanished. Believe or not, we didn't find out about it on the news. Paul and I were at the creek, skipping rocks with our ponchos on, when we noticed the tick precipitation was especially light. They'd been easing up for a while, but that day seemed different. The sun shone bright and the air smelled clean. Paul was the first to take his poncho off, and I followed suit. I almost cried after feeling the warmth of the sun on my skin. Then we heard a rustle from the edge of the tree line. Get your poncho on, Paul said. Tick's coming. But he was wrong. A mother moose bounded into the creek with her young calf in tow. She was huge, her overlong neck muscles rippling with every step. We'd been told a mother moose was one of the most dangerous creatures alive, protective as she was of her calf. Still, she seemed oblivious to us, splashing around with an almost childlike delight. It was a surprise seeing the moose, to say the least. There hadn't been a moose sighting this far south in decades. Wow, Paul whispered. She's beautiful. A reverent hush settled between us as we watched the mother moose dip her snout into the water, perhaps searching for edible reeds below the surface. White foam poured down from her muzzle back into the creek. We could see the wet brown of her eyes. The ticks were gone. I didn't know how I knew. But I knew. Matt Goldberg has stories published or forthcoming in a number of literary journals and magazines, including Piff Magazine, Bending Genres, Bards and Sages Quarterly, and others. He earned his MFA from Temple University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You can find him on Twitter at Matt M. Goldberg. Do you love video games, science fiction, and fantasy television? Tune in to the Nonsensory Podcast. Join hosts Evan and Joe as they explore the latest and greatest in speculative media and gaming. Find their channel, Nonsensory, on YouTube and subscribe to never miss an episode. The Truth is in the Retelling by Jordan E. McNeil 1. Once there was a mother and her two children. The three of them lived in a cottage on the edge of a wood. You know the one. Trees upon trees teeming with magic and danger. The children, unafraid, ran in the leaves without their mother, found a lost boy without a mother, a lost boy with bark for skin and acorns for eyes. The children fell in love with the lost boy, the way only children can, and they took him by the hand and ran. 2. Once there was a mother, a single mother of two girls. She wanted nothing more than to be the mother her own mother was for her, wings spread, warm protection from the elements. But her mother had a partner, and she had no one, just her girls and a lonely cottage on the edge of a wood. You know the one. The mother knew, too. Everyone knew, and tales of the magic, darkened wood traveled far. Her mother tried to tell them to her girls, her two young girls, but children can be fickle creatures, fidgety and unaware of their own fragility. She tried, oh, she tried, but her tired voice and body could only do as much as it could do. And when she had her back turned, her two young girls entered the wood. 3. Once there was a man who refused to be called father. He tried, he said, he tried, but children were not what he agreed to. This marriage was supposed to equate to more. More status, more money, more support for him. He did not know that also meant more bodies to clothe, more mouths to feed, so much more that anything he gained he lost immediately. Tattered dress, cold nights, empty bellies. The man felt cheated, 
and took it out on his new young family by planning to leave them. He sold their land and moved them into a small cottage on the edge of a wood. You know the one. In the middle of the night, the man pocketed the money and walked away through the cover of the trees. He was never seen again. 4. Once there was a wood. You know the one. Trees as far as the eye can see. A green so lush it could only be magic. The wood existed for years upon years, hundreds of years, and grew with each turn of the earth. It mirrored the growth of the world around it. Larger. Denser. Darker. Oh, the stories those leaves could tell. Stories of monstrous existence. If only you cared to listen. 5. Once there was a mother, though not the one you'd recognize. She never asked to be a parent, never asked to be left in a minuscule cottage on the edge of a wood. You know the one. As if she didn't have plans of her own, as if the man who abandoned her was the only one disappointed by the outcome of their marriage. The children were a handful, one for each of the mother's hands which she often had occupied with other things. Cooking, cleaning, working. Every day a cycle she couldn't break out of, and all she wanted was just one day of rest. Some quiet. Some peace. If she were to be honest, when her children disappeared into the wood, she felt relief. 6. Once there were two children. In some tales they're both girls. Others ungendered. Most often they're siblings, though the age difference ranges from mere seconds to years but sometimes they're unrelated, just two kids on a search, looking to fill a lack in their lives, a void no one their age should have to attempt to fill, looking for warmth, sustenance, a caring heart, a guilt-free existence. In all the stories, the children entered the wood. You know the one. With no love at home, they hoped to find it amongst the trees. So when they met that lost boy with bark for skin and acorns for eyes, who could blame them for feeling found? Truly, how else was their story to end, except for them to take his hand and run into the wood? 7. Once there was a boy, a boy of sticks and leaves, bark and acorns. The boy had no age, nor memory of a childhood, his only knowledge the wood. You know the one. His family was amongst the trees, in the cool shade of their leaves and the comforting embrace of their branches. He had known no other way of life, and he was happy. Once, he came across two children wandering in his home, lost. He could see the sadness in their eyes, permanently scarred in the corners of their face. Hungry, he fed them. Cold, he clothed them. Lonely, he loved them. He led them deep into the wood where it was safe and warm. They became like him, skin tough as bark, Eyes brown as acorns. And they were happy. Jordan E. McNeil writes fairy tales, rages at video games, and takes selfies with her goats. Her work can be found at Jenny Magazine, Willow, Women in Lit Lifting Other Women, Curating Alexandria, and Arsenica. She can be found on Twitter at JE underscore McNeil. This concludes another episode of Tales from the Arcanist. To read these stories and hundreds more, visit thearcanist.io. Find us on Facebook, on Twitter at the underscore Arcanists, on Instagram at the Arcanist Mag, or at patreon.com slash the Arcanist. As always, thank you for listening. Music for this episode provided by Space Invader. Music